Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. My name is Christina McDonald. I'm the executive director of the Yukon Conservation Society. Thank you to Sean Smith for the opening prayer. And I would like to acknowledge that uh, we are on the traditional territory of the Kwanlun Dun First Nation and the Taan Quechan Council. And uh, I've been here for almost eight years in Whitehorse. And most of my time has been here on uh, this traditional territory. And uh, I've uh, felt so welcomed and uh, nourished by this land. Um, so we're here today to celebrate the porcupine caribou. Why the porcupine caribou herd? Why now? Well, there are a number of reasons. We know that President Trump wants to develop the oil and gas in their calving grounds. And the Gwich'in have sent delegates to Washington, Washington DC about this. And Lorraine Mitro will be speaking later uh, tonight about that. We know that Northern Cross Yukon wants to develop oil and gas in the Caribou's wintering range in Eagle Plain. Sebastian Jones is going to be speaking later this morning about that. And we also know that the populations of the barren ground caribou are plummeting across the country. Justina Ray and Ann Gunn will be talking about uh, what has led to this later this afternoon. But we also know that relative to other herds, uh, of uh, barren ground herds, the porcupine caribou herd is healthy, relatively healthy. And uh, Joe Tetlici of the Porcupine Caribou Management Board and Don Russell will be speaking to the factors that have kept the herd healthy. But what's not to celebrate about the porcupine caribou? They're absolutely beautiful creatures. Uh, and I had a close encounter with caribou, woodland caribou, over the Easter weekend. I was with some friends and we were kick sledding between Carcross and Tagish over the ice. And we saw a, a group of 12 caribou also crossing the frozen lake. And uh, we all just stopped and watched in, in silence until they were just specks on the ice. Um, and there are many ways to describe caribou. Uh, but when I see caribou, and I've been fortunate to see um, caribou, um, not just this past weekend, but before, but they just, they look so perfect on the land. Um, can I get a show of hands? I've seen caribou. Who else here in the auditorium has seen caribou? Okay, pretty much 100%. Who here has seen the porcupine caribou? Okay, so most people here in the room, I have not seen the porcupine caribou. That's something that I, I hope to see uh, soon. So everyone, I think, has a caribou story, and they inspire a lot of emotions in people. Um, and we've brought people, a num uh, the guest speakers here today, to bring their diverse perspectives to bear on the caribou. Uh, and I mentioned when I see caribou, I think um, absolute perfection on the land. They, it's... They're so natural. Um, and I wonder for, for the folks here, what do caribou evoke in you? You know, if there was one word to describe the last time you saw a caribou, what would it be? Just throw some words out there. Dead? Okay, we, we know that caribou are very tasty. <laughs> we also know that ro the, the number of caribou being hit by, by cars over the winter. I heard life. Freedom, endurance, they make the barren ground make massive migrations over mountains and across rivers. Grace, when I saw those caribou this weekend, they just, they glide over the ice. Soul. Completion. They complete the environment they're in. Matt? Innocence. Timelessness. Magical. Anyone else? Thank you for sharing. I'm getting tingles up here. Um, so this, um, this day isn't a particularly special day for the porcupine caribou. It's not a birthday, for example. But uh, classic celebrations like birthdays or weddings, they're not so much about the day as they are about everything that led to that moment and everything that is to come and taking the time to share what we cherish about the guest of honor. And today, that's the porcupine caribou. And that's what this celebration is about. The Yukon Conservation Society has brought together 
a really fantastic array of speakers, uh, to including traditional knowledge experts, managers, scientists, academics, academics, and artists, to share with us their perspectives on the porcupine caribou herd, its ancient presence on the land and coexistence with indigenous people, the management practices, practices which have supported herd health, the threats to its survival, and how they can be mitigated or avoided, and what we all can do, what we must do, to help ensure the caribou stay strong for the next 10,000 years. Uh, so the panel is uh, bringing, uh, and then uh, we also have a panel discussion, and that, again, I think is, I'm quite excited about because it's bringing together this diversity of perspectives. We're going to be hearing from Brandon Kikovicic of the Wuntuk Gwich'in First Nation, Joe Tetlici of the Porcupine Caribou Management Board, Joyce Majiski, an artist, and some of her beautiful work is on display in the lobby, as well as Justina Ray, a senior scientist with COSIWIC. We also have authors here today to share with us um, this the fantastic Caribou Cookbook that was recently launched. Uh, Kelly Milner, Michene, and Dina Lemke of the Porcupine Caribou Management Board will be speaking to that, and there's going to be some caribou tasters at lunch. And tonight, Julie Frisch, Friends of the Dempster Country, uh, will be launching their book about the Dempster Highway. And we also have a fantastic a selection of film screenings and presentations later tonight and all day tomorrow. We've built in a lot of time for questions and discussions, uh, so this is an opportunity for everyone here to share their perspectives. And um, we've got a lot of people here who I think have uh, a long history themselves with the caribou. And so I hope that you will contribute to the next two days. And if you're unable to stay for the whole event, although I don't know how you could tear yourself away, um, it is being live streamed and recorded. So hello to everyone who's tuning in from wherever you are. Uh, you can, and if you miss it, you can also, it's going to be recorded so you can watch it after the fact. So just uh, very briefly um, to talk about the Yukon Conservation Society, that's the organization I work for. Uh, it was established in 1968, so we'll be celebrating our 50th anniversary in 2018. So for an environmental NGO, non-governmental organization, we're ancient, we're one of the oldest in Canada, but of course we are very much newcomers to the Yukon. So one of the fantastic things about working for an organization with such a long history is that you bump into people who it seems to have, at one point in time, either worked for YCS or sat on the board or moved through the office, which is fun. But we also have a very, we have a long history and a lot of uh, a deep sort of corporate memory. And we adopted our Caribou logo sometime in the late 70s. Thank you to Julie Frisch for looking through our archives. It's our Caribou logo um, was adopted sometime between 76 and 79. And it's no coincidence that the Dempster Highway was opened in 1979. And at that time, there were many concerns about the impact of the highway on the caribou. YCS was a strong voice at that time, and we continue to be a leading voice for conservation in the territory. So please do check out our membership display that's uh, out in the lobby. Pick up a membership brochure and uh, consider joining or supporting our organization. Your donations and support are very important. So I hope you come away from this event with a greater connection to the porcupine caribou herd, if perhaps uh, you don't know much about them or maybe don't feel as connected. Uh, I hope you come away with a greater sense of connection to the land and to the people. And Sean spoke to that in his opening prayer about how important that is, that uh, feeling connection to the land and to the people and supporting one another. And I think that is what is going to save us, connection to the land and animals. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again, that I think here in the Yukon, uh, compared to the South, for example, that much of it is, is much more developed, that we do have an opportunity to develop a much stronger connection to the land. And uh, that's that I, I know is an enormous source of strength and inspiration for me, and as, as it is, I'm sure, for everyone here. So. One more thing, I hope you'll bear with me. Um, I have a poem that is very dear to my heart, and it's by Wendell E. Berry, who is an American novelist, poet, and an environmental activist. He's also a farmer, and as a farmer, he's very intimately aware that if the land isn't thriving, then the people aren't thriving. And the poem is uh, called The Peace of Wild Things, and it's short, and I'd just like to share it with you today, because I think Poetry, perhaps, is the one thing that we don't have represented over the course of the next two days. We've got pretty much everything else. So this is The Piece of Wild Things by Wendell Berry. 
When despair for the world grows in me, and I wake in the night at the least sound, in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water, and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water, and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. So, in conclusion, I'd like to thank the Porcupine Caribou Management Board and the Vuntut Gwich'in First Nation for their support for this event. It uh, certainly couldn't have happened without you, so thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank all of the wonderful guest speakers uh, who are taking the time to, to come and share their insights and knowledge with us. I'd like to thank the small but um, determined uh, fleet of volunteers who are going to make this thing tick for us over the next couple days. Uh, the YCS Board of Directors, uh, and uh, I'd also like to thank the funders, and those include the City of Whitehorse Environment Grant, the Community Fund for Canada's 150th, a collaboration between the Government of Canada and the Community Foundations of Canada, the Friends of Dempster Country Society, and of course all of our fantastic supporters. So thank you, and without, the, uh, without further ado, I'll uh, pass it off to Sebastian, who is here to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is Joe Ted Leachy of the Porcupine Caribou Management Board. Joe has been uh, the chair of the Porcupine Caribou Management Board since his appointment in 1995. He was born at his family's traditional camp on the Peel River, 75 kilometers upstream from Fort McPherson, Northwest Territories. After 12 years in residential school, Joe decided to spend some time out on the land to reconnect with his parents, living a traditional subsistence way of life. 20 years later, he decided to move back into the community. He served as chair of the Tetlet Gwich'in Renewable Resources Council, chief of the Tetlet Gwich'in First Nation in the Northwest Territories. Joe moved to Old Crow, Yukon in 1995 and lived there with his family until 2008. He presently lives in Whitehorse with his wife and their two sons. He is employed with the Council of Yukon First Nations as a support worker to residential school clients. As chair of the PCMB, Joe has traveled extensively to share the PCMB's co-management experience with other groups and organizations that may be struggling with similar challenges and situations. The board continues to seek ways of complementing the wealth of science-based knowledge with more local and traditional knowledge with the goal of making balanced, informed decisions and building positive, enduring relationships among government and community stakeholders. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, like Sebastian said, uh, my name is Joseph Tedlici and I'm the chair of the Pork Pan Caribou Management Board. Um, it's it's so nice to be here to, uh, to talk on the uh, Porcupine Caribou, because um, I've always said this is a passion of mine. Um, before I even start, I, I just like to welcome um, you to the uh, to the two-day conference that we're going to have on the Porcupine Caribou. I'd like to also acknowledge some of our board members here. We have Billy Store from the Inevaluate Game Council, way in the corner here, and I believe we have uh, Dina. Dina Lemke is our executive director. Matt is also uh, works with us in regards to uh, uh, the logistics of, of managing the caribou. Um, I see Lauren Nitro here too from Old Crow. She was a past uh, member on the board. I also see a lot of other quote old faces. Okay, So um, I've been a on the board, I've been chair of the board for, I always say, a number of years. Um, the challenge I'm going to have um, Matt do is I've never ever followed a script because over the years uh, I've just developed, and I'll tell you a story about it, why I do this. Because in the early 1990s, um, one of our friends from lower 48, he, he had a he had a f photography business, and there was a big um, commotion, I guess, in the Arctic Refuge about the United States government trying to open up the refuge. So National Geographic 
um, got a hold of this guy and told him, we want you to go to the Arctic Refuge and do a story on the Arctic Refuge and on the caribou, because there's a threat to the caribou there. So he was very naive and he says, okay, I'll do it, because he was a professional photographer. He stayed, stayed up there for six weeks and he did thousands of thousands of pictures on the Arctic Refuge. Then he came back to the to um, uh, Fairbanks, and he met a Gutchen lady there, and they start talking. And finally, she said, "What are you doing here?" She said, "I'm I'm doing uh, a story on the porcupine caribou and the threat on the calving grounds, and I've just done six weeks in the Arctic Refuge, and." I've got the story, so I'm just going to go back home and deliver it to the to National Geographic, who contracted me to do that. And the lady told him, "Well, if you really want to know about the porcupine caribou, you need to go to the Kuchin communities." And um, he said, "What's that?" And he says, "You need to go to the four communities in the um, Alaska and the eight communities in the Yukon and the NWT." So he went to a an inquiry into uh, in f art in Venati, and there was a lot of um, United States government people there talking about about what's going to happen if oil comes into the Arctic Refuge or if there's development. And there was a there was an elderly Gutchen person that wanted to talk, and 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 the, and the coordinator that coordinated that meeting told him, "I'm sorry." But our plane is coming in five minutes. Thank you. We gotta go now, and 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 basically left the um, Guchin elder standing there without telling the story, and and that just really uh, struck him because he did so much on the caribou that he forgot the the centerpiece on that was the Guchin people, and he didn't realize that, so he went back down to uh, California sold his business, and out of the thousands and thousands of slides that he took, he developed a slideshow. And he started doing um, slide presentations across the Arctic Refuge or across the lower 48. But he realized in the in a short time that he started doing it that he wasn't the person to talk for the Guchin. So he started trying to uh, recruit um, possible people to go down and and uh, and there was a lot of people educating I, I I like to use the word educating rather than lobbying uh, that went down before me but when I got recruited uh, back in 93 I think it was um, I had to go down in May I remember and uh, I remember being in Minnesota St. Paul and my last destination to Washington, D.C., where Lenny was going to pick me up, I started jotting down notes. And by the time I got to um, um, Washington, we landed, I had three pages of what I was going to say. But as soon as we landed, I realized, what am I doing? Uh, I lived out on the land for 20 years. This is my life. Why do I need to... Why do I need to talk from a script? So I tore it up, and, and from then on, I've always developed a, a way of just talking from the heart because I, I lived it. And, and so that's the challenge that Matt is going to uh, <laughs> come up with because I'm going to be talking about the, the management of the pork man caribou, and uh, he has to align the, the pictures with my story. So... So here goes. Um, the porcupine caribou man. Oh, I just wanted to say this first. I feel like I'm 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 being judged up here too because I I talked about all these old old people here that I've uh, that I've developed a good relationship with over the years that I've um, uh, worked with the porcupine caribou and a lot of these people, you know, they were. They were um, basically mentors of mine, and um, I've I've traveled with them to Venati, to Arctic Village, to Fairbanks, and to a lot of uh, North American caribou conferences. And they're all sitting here, so uh, it it feels like I'm up here to 
present something and then they're going to give me a mark on it and it feels very uneasy but anyway um, like I said this is a passion of mine and and that's what really keeps me going I think in, in working with the porcupine caribou because number one it's so important for our Aboriginal people sure we can study the um, the porcupine caribou and we can see what's happening to them but the outcome of whether the caribou exist or not will really hurt the only people that really depend on the porcupine caribou and that's the Gwich'in and the Inuvialuit people. Um, so it's really important that we, uh, we, we, we try anything and everything to, to make sure that that porcupine caribou is always there. So I'm going to start my presentation by just saying thank you for giving me the opportunity to come here to present um, the Porcupine Caribou Management Board and what, what we have to offer in regards to, to management. I always say that the, uh, the Porcupine Caribou Management Board was established under the Inevaluate Final Agreement. So the agreement for the Porcupine Caribou was actually um, from the Inevaluate Final Agreement Back in 19, back in the early 70s, the federal government um, tasked the honorable, I guess you could tell him that, call him that, the honorable Judge Berger to go to the communities in the Northwest Territories and the Yukon and, and, and talk to the people about the possibility of a pipeline going down the Mackenzie Valley. At that time, uh, nobody had any land claims there was no political organizations. There was just chief and council. Uh, and he went to all the communities in regards to getting feedback on what did they think of the pipeline. After two years of going to 26 communities in the Northwest Territories and also uh, four communities in the Yukon, he wrote a, a, a report. And basically the report said there'd be a moratorium for 10 years until the uh, First Nations Aboriginal people have uh, gotten together and got their land claims settled. The Inevaluate Final Agreement was the first one. I think it was back in 81, I believe, somewhere around 1984. So from 19, yeah, 1984. So one of the clauses in the uh, Inevaluate Final Agreement states that let there be a, a pork pine caribou agreement established. So in 1985, uh, the porcupine caribou agreement was established. Out of that porcupine caribou agreement, there was a porcupine caribou board established. It was back in 85. All the people that were connected or had some affiliation with harvesting the porcupine caribou or managing the caribou were part of the porcupine caribou board. So we have one representative from the, the federal government, one representative from the Yukon government, one from the GN, GNWT, and we have five First Nations that are associated with the board. We have the Inevaluate Game Council, we have the Gwich'in Tribal Council on the Yukon side, we have the Nachoniakden, Mayo people, we also have the uh, Vanta Gwich'in, Okro, uh, and we also have the Tronda Gwich'in, Dawson. So eight members to the board. Our main mandate of the, the Porcupine Caribou Management Board is for the, for the protection of the health uh, of the herd and of the protection of the habitat and the continuance, meaning we always want that caribou there for future generations. And, it's, um, and that's, I think that's one of our main priorities is to make sure that they are there for future generations. One of the, um, I guess one of the uh, main mandates as a board is to make sure that communication is, 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 communication is so important to the board. And the way we do that is we, we, we travel two or three times a, uh, a year to the communities and we straddle our meetings between the Northwest Territories and the Yukon. The, um, and that's where we get a lot of our information. Um, 
One of the things we talk about a lot is uh, traditional knowledge. Uh, that's so important to the board because a lot of times uh, we as uh, managers uh, are out here, you know, making presentations, but there's actually, right as we speak, people um, hunting caribou in Okro that are our eyes and ears out there, and they give us information. And after a while, I'll be talking about the harvest management plan and the implementation plan and how that traditional knowledge is brought forth to our board. But we make sure that, uh, I talked about the, the habitat range. The habitat range is, uh, is about 250,000 square kilometers right across the Northwest Territories, Yukon, and into Alaska. We also have about 12, 14 First Nations, 14 Kuchin communities, and also we have um, a couple of communities in the Northwest Territories that the Inavaluate are part of too. So the, uh, the communities are strategically located along the migration route of the porcupine caribou. For anybody that doesn't know, uh, Old Crow is strategically, geographically, I guess, uh, situated right on the migration route of the porcupine caribou. And I just need to throw this in that in the next three or four weeks, they're going to have a big celebration in Old Crow called the Caribou Days. It's, it's, um, it's, it's the weekend to actually appreciate and celebrate the caribou from uh, f coming back to the community to, to give life to the community and give um, their subsistent needs to the community. So that's going to happen in, I believe it's Victoria weekend. Um, so back to my presentation, the habitat range is, is, is really key to uh, the sustainability of the porcupine caribou, 250 square miles. Um, one of the things that we talk about a lot is industrial development. We've been fighting, um, we've, been, we've been challenged with protecting the Arctic Refuge the calving ground since 1988, and that's really important. And today I can stand up there and, and safely say that there hasn't been any dr drill rigs or any kind of exploration or development on the Arctic Refuge. And that's mainly because of uh, people like Lorraine and my wife Glenna, and a lot of people from the Northwest Territories and the Yukon that actually go down to the lower 48 to lobby to educate the grassroots people on the importance of protecting this place. So that's, that's positive. And, and furthermore, we need to do that on our side because one of the things we can't do is contradict ourselves saying, well, we need to protect this land uh, for the calving grounds, for the, for the birth of the porcupine caribou. And yet, on the same token, we need to protect on our side the Porcupine Caribou Management Board is not against development. We're, we're, we're for responsible government, uh, responsible uh, development, and, and, and that's key. One of our um, mandates is if there's any disruption or if there's any, um, any types of activities that's going dis to disrupt the migration of the Porcupine Caribou, then we get involved. We get involved right from the from the get go, and that's really important to note. I know over the past years and from way back, uh, there was a lot of seismic, there was a lot of development in 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 the range of the porcupine caribou and others, but um, um, today we have a voice and we can we we can talk about why we need to protect the porcupine caribou. Um, we've heard stories, and I've personally seen seismic crews and, and oil development going through our backyards without even us knowing about it. As a matter of fact, I remember back in 1981, I believe, it seemed like there was a, a, a six-lane highway going up the Peel River, and nobody knew about it. And all this time, it was seismic crews going up to do seismic... Um, seismic uh, operations between Road River and uh, Trail River, and that was about 60, 70 miles upriver. So it just gives you an example of how, 
how 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 things were at one time and how things are happening now because we have a voice now and we could talk about why it's important to to once again protect these um, wonderful um, herds that we have. I think the health of the herd is really important too um, in order to sustain our people and sustain the world. Uh, we need to make sure that the porcupine caribou is healthy and we do that through a number of ways. We have um, our porcupine caribou technical committee that gives us a lot of information in regards to uh, where the caribou are, what they're doing, their calving, their post calving, all that information um, so that so that we know wh where and what the caribou are doing. Uh, the health of the herd is really important. Once again, we get traditional knowledge from uh, the local people. Uh, we have eight communities in the Northwest Territories and the Yukon. And they're the people that are, are eyes and ears out on the land. When they do get caribou, and, and these people are professional uh, butchers, if you can call them that, and if there's anything that's, that's um, out of the ordinary, they're going to know. And Mary Gamberg is here. She, she works with us in regards to contaminants. And uh, along with the biologist of the Yukon, um, we get that information from the communities. It, and that's really important. Uh, we talk about the health of the herd. And, and I think one of the things that we should mention is, um, along with the Alaska Fish and Game, and the um, Canadian Wildlife Service or the Yukon biologist, we make sure that the herd is healthy uh, population-wise too. One of the things that they've, they've always done over the past 30, 40 years is try to get a count uh, on the calving grounds of the porcupine caribou. And the way they do that is that uh, the, the plains are already on the Arctic Refuge and three things have to come together. First, the weather has to uh, uh, cooperate with us. The caribou have to cooperate. And once that happens, and the planes have to be ready. So um, when the caribou all come together about a year, about a month after calving, uh, the mosquitoes pull them together because they're harassed so much. They get relief from coming together. When they come together, and there's blue skies. Uh, the biologist will 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 get the planes to start flying, and then they'll start taking the pictures. But the three factors have to come together. Sometimes weather doesn't uh, cooperate, and we have to stop um, the count. Sometimes it's too smoky, it's too foggy. We wouldn't get a count. So it's really important that those three factors come together. Over the years, we've seen a lot of ups and downs in regards to uh, the, uh, the herds in, in Canada and in the Alaska. Um, the porcupine caribou is very fortunate that our herd is still healthy. Back in, when, when we first when I first got on board and started talking about the history of the porcupine caribou and when it was established back in 1985, I think the f one of the c first counts that I've known was, I mean, they had counts in 70s, but in 1987, when they did a, wh when they did a count, the porcupine caribou was 100 and 78,000. So that was 1989, 178,000. And we try to get a count every two years. But sometimes, like I said, it doesn't happen. For some reason, whether it's too foggy or too smoky or the caribou are not cooperating with us, uh, for some reason from 1989 to 2001, we didn't get a count. So to put roughly 10 years, we didn't kind of get a count. During that time, everybody was 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 running around trying to, you know, trying to uh, uh, 
uh, find different ways technology wise to, to try to get a better count. So from 1989 to 2001, we didn't get a count. In 2001, we finally got a count and the porcupine caribou was 123,000. So over a 10 year period, we lost roughly 50, 60,000 porcupine caribou. In the meantime, we're watching other herds, and especially in the NWT, we realized that the Cape Bathurst and the Blue Nose East, Blue Nose West were drastically declining. In 1999, we, we, we wanted to, as a porcupine caribou management board, we wanted to get ahead of the game to, 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 um, <coughs> to do something that was going to help us in regards to trying to protect the porcupine caribou herd. So we knew that we knew that other herds around the porcupine caribou were drastically declining. So in 1999, we got a dro draft scoping document in regards to a harvest management plan. Because we have a lot of, I mean, we, we have no control over climate change. We have no control over global warming. But wh what we do have control over is harvesting. So we focused on harvesting, and we wanted to develop a harvest management plan because we, ha we could have control over that. In 1999, we hired uh, Lindsay Staples to um, give us an idea of what does a harvest management plan look like. So we did a draft scoping document, and the first thing was the, a, uh, a protocol. Everybody's agreed that we need, to, we need to come together for a harvest management plan. The next step was a, a, a draft harvest management plan. The third and most important was a native user agreement because without those three, we wouldn't have a harvest management plan. So we developed that draft harvest scoping document. And when we heard that in, in 2001, when the herd, when we got our first count after 10 years was 123,000, we lost 50, 60,000 caribou somewhere. In the meantime, around us, other herds were declining. So we developed a harvest workshop in Inuvik in 2001. And basically, we brought all the people from the Yellowknife area, all the people from the Yukon and the NWT to this workshop. And what we wanted to get out of them was what were we actually going to do if the porcupine caribou started declining? And, and people didn't have an idea because people have always gone out onto the land and they, they had so much respect for the caribou that they knew that the caribou was always going to come back. And they always did come back. But with, with technology these, these, these days and with, with industrial develop and global warming, climate change, it's, it's hurting the porcupine caribou. So we needed, we needed to do something that was gonna help the porcupine caribou. So um, in 2001, when, that, when the, the porcupine started declining, we, we initiated uh, this harvest workshop. So we asked people to come up to the board and say, what would you do if the porcupine caribou is 150,000? And then we start lowering the population and said, what would you do if the population was 100,000? What would you do if the population was 90,000? And slowly we saw the trend of the, 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 the actual harvesters out there actually going up to the board and saying, you know, we're gonna hunt like we always do. Suddenly the porcupine caribou was declining to uh, let's say 90, 80,000, and they started telling themselves, well, maybe we, should, maybe we should stop hunting like we usually do and just cut back, or maybe we should start just taking the bulls versus leave and leaving the cows. So we saw a trend where people started realizing, oh my goodness, you know, this could happen to the porcupine caribou too. So it was a real eye-opener for, for the harvesters out there that something could happen and something could happen to our caribou. So over time, over a, 
five years from 2001, we saw all the 10 megahertz in Canada drastically declining. And we saw the George River herd, which was close to a million uh, 10 years ago, come down to about 20,000. And we have the Bathurst herd in, in the Yellowknife area that was at one time probably around 480,000, now to roughly about less than 20,000 as we speak. So we've seen these herds around us drastically declining, and we didn't want that happen to our to the herd that we depend on. So in 2007, we developed, we, we made a resolution on the, uh, with the Porcupine Caribou Management Board that uh, we were going to look at conservation. So we, we made a resolution saying that we were going to have, uh, the we we're going to conserve the Porcupine Caribou herd. And, and I think that was a real eye opener for a lot of people. Just before that, uh, between 2001 and 2007, we, we didn't get a count in those six years, but there was a lot of controversy and we used, we used all kinds of different methods to try to find out the population wise. And um, through that, in 2007, from 2007 to 2010, we started working on our harvest management plan. It took us about four years to develop this harvest management plan. And basically, the harvest management plan dictates to the communities what we need to do in case the herd goes to a certain population. Um, we have management actions. One of the things that we've um, talked about is a fire chart. When we went to the 2001 meeting, people were talking about how do we really give a clear message to the people that if we do have to uh, stop hunting, um, what we needed to do. Uh, a person from Old Crow said, well, why don't we use the fire chart? Because in the summertime, we go on the highway and if we see the, the arrow going onto the red, we know that there's no fires. We can't have any fires. But if it's in the green, people know that they can actually go out and have fires, have picnics. So we developed that same kind of scenario but one of the challenges we had was using numbers. And we had to, we had to figure out a way to, uh, to put the numbers to the color zone. So after about six months, I think, we finally um, agreed upon the 40,000, 45,000 in the red, uh, 80,000 in the orange, 80,000 in the yellow, and if it's over 115,000, it's in the green zone. 115,000 in the green zone. So that's how we develop our color chart. And it's, it's been working really well with the communities. Um, one of the other challenges with the harvest management plan is through our annual harvest meeting. We know that every, every year, the second week of February, uh, we're going to come together as stakeholders, as governments, as agencies, and come to a place, usually in Dawson or in Nuvik, uh, we straddle the meetings between the two territories to, to uh, come together and talk about uh, caribou. And at the end of the two-day session, we'll have an in-camera meeting with the Porcupine Caribou Management alone to look over all the information that we've gathered from different agencies, from the communities, HTCs, the RRCs, and come to a place where we make a decision on what uh, color zone the porcupine caribou is in. And with that comes management actions. It's, I think um, that's one of our biggest challenges uh, over the past 10 years, I think. From when the harvest management started to to when it was completed, signed, sealed, and delivered. It took us 10 years, right from the draft scoping document back in 1999 to when it was actually signed in 2010. It took us 10 years. Without a harvest management plan, without an implementation plan, the harvest management plan will just grow dust. We knew that. So we developed that harvest management plan, and within six 
six months, we developed an implementation plan. And the implementation plan dictates to all parties what we need to do in regards to the caribou population-wise. So with the Porcupine Caribou Management Board, I think it's really important to note too that um, we work with the communities. And I talked about communication. In order to get a buy-in from the communities, we really needed to go to the communities to educate them, to explain what we're doing. And, and I think that's really, it's, it's, it's really worked well because that's, that's uh, I think that's a really vital piece of, of um, getting success. Um, a lot of our people have always said that we know what's happening out there. And we took it upon ourselves to go to the communities to get their input, okay? So that's, that's really important when you get a buy-in from the communities. Um, I can honestly say that the porcupine caribou is, is doing well. Um, and I'll give you an example. When I said in 1989, the porcupine caribou was 178,000, 2001, it was 123,000. And 2001, we didn't get a count for another 10 years. 2010, uh, we got another count, and that was, I believe, 169,000. Two years later, 2013, we got another count. It was 197,000. 2015, we tried to get a count, but for some reason, I think the I think the central Arctic herd was mixed up with the uh, with the porky, so we didn't get a, a good count there. So we didn't get a count for the past since 2013. So that's six years now. Hopefully, this this um, this this spring we get another count. So that's basically. All I have in regards to the harvest management plan. One of the things that um, I think is really important to note is that before before Western the Western world came into the communities, our people were very subsistence. They did they depended on uh, travel by dog team. Uh, they lived out there with the caribou and respect was so important to their people because they knew that if they disrespected the caribou, the caribou was not going to come back. And that was really, uh, I guess, the number one lesson that our people have learned. And, and that's so important. We had our own management way of doing things. And I can recall back when we were just children, you know, the, the GNWT used to... Uh, for some reason, they used to get a charter plane for the community. And I come from Fort McPherson. So the first week in January, they used to, they used to send a plane to Fort McPherson and say, um, you can use this for a caribou search. And that was, that was a really big thing because they would take three or four of their hunters and they would go from Rat River right up to... Uh, Road River, then cut south to the to the uh, Richardson Mountains and look around the. It's called we call it Caribou Mountain, but on the map it's called Lusk Lake. But they used to go all around there, and it's a three-hour flight, eh? And then the hunters would come back, land, and all the community would go down to the to the uh, gravel bar because there's going to be news of maybe caribou or no caribou, and this was an exciting time. And then when the uh, three hunters come out, they would conversate with the chief and council. And then right on the bar, the, the chief would say, you know, Masicho, there's caribou at this certain place. And then next morning, you would hear dog teams and everything just noisy. Everybody would be just leaving. So those were exciting times. Now all we can do is we can go to the computer and um, 
do one tap there and locate the caribou. So over the 40 years, uh, things have really changed technologically. Um, but having said that, our people are still grounded to the values that we we inherited from our elders. And, and I think that's really important. And I'll give you a good example. Right now, the only people in in Canada that are, are harvesting caribou now are the Bantakuchin. They've had caribou all year, which is really good. People in the Mackenzie Delta didn't see caribou all year. So they had a pretty pretty rough time this year. And uh, this, there's, they're not going to get caribou possibly until next fall. And people are hurting there. And that's, I, I tell you this because caribou is so important to our people. It's, it's, it's their diet. And when they don't have it, then it's, it's just not good for them. I had, a, I had a nephew that came here last, I think a couple of days ago, and he was going back. So I sent some meat over. And people really appreciated that because the, the cost of living is so high that people depend on the porcupine caribou for their diet. Um, one of the things, one of the good values that we have also is sharing. And uh, people have come a long way from Fort McPherson to come to Oak Row with skidoos. It takes them two days. But there were some people that actually came over uh, in the last two months to actually uh, uh, harvest caribou in Oak Row then skidoo it all the way back to Fort McPherson. But, but there's a good example of how people share. And, and I think that's really important, and I hope that tradition continues. Over the number of years that I've, I just want to close with this, um, these final uh, thoughts. Over the years, when I first got on the board, people were saying, Aboriginal people were saying, you know, it's my Aboriginal right to go out and harvest how much I want, what time, wh how much, um, wherever. Whenever, it's my Aboriginal right. 20 years later, people are actually saying, it's my Aboriginal right to go out there and harvest, but I also have a responsibility. So we've come a long way from, in regards to conservation. Um, our people have bought into uh, cooperating Management-wise, and I think my good friend is here, Don Russell. He can remember when they first started trying to put satellite callers on the porcupine caribou. The people were just livid. They couldn't understand why the somebody wanted to put callers on the caribou. 20 years later, with a lot of good education, a lot of good pictures uh, in regards to justifying why we needed to do that, They've come on board. So now we have that cooperation with the communities, and that's the key to conservation. So with that, I hope I give a little information on regards to the communities, to management, to what we do. And I think, I think we should all feel very uh, fortunate that out of the 10 major herds in Canada, the porcupine caribou I is one of the herds that are really thriving. And I use that word thriving very cautiously because if we get two, three bad calving periods, our, our herd could go right down. But we've been very lucky. But having said that too, we've, as a board, we've done a lot of work. We've done a lot of work to, to get the communities on our side. And one good example is in 2006, when we didn't have a count. We never had a count for five years. And people were kind of assuming where the herd was. The Kuchin people in the Inavaluate said, we don't know what the count is, but we're going to voluntarily not hunt cows. So we're just going to go with the 
harvest bulls and we're going to cut back on our harvesting. So here was a perfect example of how the communities were buying into our, into our management plan and trying to help us to make sure that the porcupine caribou is here for all times. And I think that's, that's our motto for, for the harvest management plan is walking together so that the caribou is always here for future generations. So with that, Masicho, uh, thank you very much. Would anybody like to ask Joe a question? I have a question to kick things off. Um, what, uh, thank you for that presentation, really enjoyed it. Um, at what do you see the priorities being for the management board in the coming years? You spoke about the, you know, the 10 years it took to develop, a, develop the management plan and then working very quickly uh, to create the implementation plan. So the management plan just didn't co uh, sit collecting dust. But uh, yeah, in the coming years, um, what, what do you think are going to be the priorities or the challenges or the opportunities that the management board is going to be facing? We're looking at the cumulative effects. Um, we're also looking at activities around the habitat range of the porcupine caribou, specifically uh, any industrial uh, development that's happening on the porcupine caribou habitat. We're looking at that very closely. Uh, in my talk, I, I talk about uh, the porcupine caribou board not um, not being against development, but we need to be, we need to have responsible go um, development and, and that's important. Uh, so that's one, I guess, one task that we're, we're, we're looking at. There's always that global warming, climate change, you know, and, and we're always um, worried about that because uh, like I said in my talk, if we have two or three uh, bad calving periods, that really could hurt the young calves. So we're, we're looking at that too. Thank you. Dean, I'll give you a microphone, otherwise the folks uh, tuning in on live stream can't hear you. Thanks. Hi, I'm Dina. I work with the, the PCMB as well. Um, and one of the things, too, um, that I just want to add is, is uh, uh, the implementation plan is, is completed. It, it is a document that the eight parties have signed. Um, but there are components of that implementation plan that are, um, that are not yet achieved. So one of the, the key things is the, the native user agreements. And that's something that, uh, and then there will be like a like a uh, an agreement between the native users and the governments as well. And so the board is involved, even though we're not a party to it. We're we have a, a serious um, kind of a commitment and a responsibility to kind of coordinate the activities um, to to accomplish and the communications, and and to accomplish those goals in the in the. Um, in the implementation plan. So working to try to, to complete those native user agreements is a, is a key priority of, of our board. And we also have a strategic framework document that we look at annually. We kind of set it for five years, but it, it outlines goals that we have and, and we, we try to look at the, those annually. All of that information is available on our website as well at pcmb.ca. I think that's up there. and, and uh, and, and you're welcome to, to go there. Um, it's all public and all available, and, uh, and you can see exactly what we're working on, um, on progressively to, to try to, to accomplish those strategic framework goals. So I just wanted to mention that. I'd just like to know what the relationship or the involvement is of the U.S. section of the board. Shows the, your one graphic up there showed the, the Porcupine and Caribou Management Board as including Alaska, and how are they involved? Through the, uh, through the international, through the uh, Porcupine and Caribou Agreement, uh, the Porcupine and Caribou Management Board was established, and when it was established in 1985, then 
two years later, because this is an international herd, the International Porcupine Caribou Board was established. Um, it's, it's a very good question, but there's a lot of question marks in regards to the International Board. And I know there's some of my um, colleagues here that were on the board, but on the, this is my, just my personal perspective. On the, uh, the delegates on the International Board from the states are very careful with what they say. They cannot make any, any kind of arrangements or make any kind of decisions on that board unless they go to their higher higher ups. When President Bush um, became president, we didn't have a board for what, Don, about five years? Yeah, about five years. We were just an ad hoc uh, board. We didn't even meet until President Clinton got, uh, became president. Then the, um, the board it boards started up again, eh? But um, yeah, from my personal experience, we don't have very much uh, um, actions, I guess. So with that, I'm just wondering, with the new administration in the U.S., um, what are the chances that their their involvement will continue? Have you heard anything on that? It's it's going to continue. Uh, we've had our international board meetings reestablished for the past three years, and it looks it looks good. Um, the the delegates from Alaska are willing to to uh, work with um, their Canadian friends over here. However, uh, they're very cautious when it comes to the Arctic Refuge. The issue, if you, uh, uh, up on the news, um, Senator Murkowski, I believe, is, is um, rallying her supporters to open up their, the Arctic Refuge. But when we do go to the meetings, it's sort of like a hush-hush. And that's normally, it's quite common for them to do that. So just, I, I just wanted to add, um, as the, the PCMB, we are concerned about what's happening on that side. Um, but some people kind of get confused about the the, um, the membership of the PCMB. As Joe mentioned, we're on the Canadian side of the range, and so w we our mandate only covers the Canadian portion. Now, the, the, the international board that was established two years after the PCMB was, um, it, it, it includes membership from both sides, from the U.S. and Canada, and we are we are just a member of that international board. So Joe sits on, on that board and, and we, have, we have input to that, but, um, but that's not the role of the Canadian Porcupine Caribou Management Board. So are there other Canadian participants on the Canadian delegation to the international board or is it the Porcupine Caribou Management Board? Canadian the Northwest Territories has a rep on the board the Yukon Territory has a rep on the board, and the federal government has a rep on the board. And is that covered by an international treaty? Yes. Um, I have a question about um, enforcement or encouragement to um, for the uh, harvest agreement, where your chart showed that um, for First Nations hunters they're encouraged not to uh, harvest cows, and how that, I was wondering how that takes place in, in, on the ground. I, um, okay. I talk about, before in my talk, I talk about the cooperation between the communities and the board. Uh, we're a management board, but we can't do everything. So we try to get cooperation from the communities in regards to their harvesting and uh, the challenges that they have. Uh, one of the things that we try to respect is that we don't want to go into Oak Row and say, you have to do this, you have to do that. I don't want to go to Fort McPherson 
or Inuvik or Tsiga Chick and say, you guys have to do this. So with cooperation and with the board members that sit on the board, uh, that message relays back to the communities. I try to make it my business to, to visit the user communities, and there's eight of them on the Yukon NWT site, to, to talk to them. Because basically, after all these years that I've been on the board, I, I know all the, every individual, might as well say, in the community. So taking them on the side and just explaining the justification of why we want no cow harvest or anything goes a long way. And I give you an, a good example in 2006 when we didn't have a count and all around the, um, the habitat of the porcupine caribou, the herds were going down. The communities themselves said, we're not going to hunt cows. Um, at one time, uh, cows were a delicacy, pregnant cows were a delicacy to the communities. Things have changed now where uh, that's not so now, but people are trying to, uh, let's say, get dry cows versus get the pregnant cows now. So when they're, they're turning their harvesting to getting maybe bulls versus cows because they see that the end result, we don't want that uh, the decline to happen to the porcupine caribou. Um, I see Cho, uh, Joe, thank you for that information. Um, I just wanted to make a comment regarding the, uh, the color chart. Um, just for, for the folks here, you know, we, uh, we in the Kuchin uh, uh, communities um, over the years have, have seen many challenges up and down. And even though today the, the porcupine caribou herd is healthy, we went through a time when we were in the red zone. And when we're talking as Kuchin people about um, the porcupine caribou herd, we're talking about our way of life. We're talking about our food. And so for us, it's, as Joe was saying, is very, very serious. And I, r I just wanted to make a comment when, when we were in the red zone with with basically no hunting you know our people was very very um, concerned and and so we had to so we even though we wanted our hunters wanted to harvest we also had to respect and 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 be prepared to take those kind of extreme measures. And we're t thinking, uh, and at those times, you know, even though we were in extreme food insecurity, we had to think also about future generations and how that was going to look if we didn't take responsibility at that time. So I just wanted to add that because we went through pretty much all the, I think, color, colors on the color chart with in, in different management from, from our community and from our hunters. Masi. Just, just for clarification, um, we were never in the red zone. Um, however, when we, when we didn't have a count between 2001 and 2010, uh, you know, there was different assumptions of where the herd was, so we had to take precautionary methods or precautionary uh, decisions on where we were, but um, we're still in the green zone now. All right, thank you very much, Joe.